that go out from the towers were all lit. Uh, and if you notice, if you looked carefully, and you can have a look when you go back out, but the in the bowl of the telescope, uh, underneath, there's a sort of a strip of light that runs around uh, and at various other places you can see light coming from sort of inside the, the ball so basically that's the sort of cavity inside the telescope between the the bottom surface uh, which is the original surface and the one that sits above it which is the one we actually use to reflect radio waves um, so the bottom surface is being replaced so last summer uh, we replaced from the center all the way out to where that ring of light is and the ring of light is where they've taken off the panels and so you're seeing through into where it's all lit inside where they're working uh, and they're gradually going to work their way out and hopefully over the course of this summer complete the job uh, and we'll have a we'll have a, a nice uh, replaced surface all, all the way on the back but it's a it's a big job so in fact the telescope's now parked in this position till till november um, so it's been parked for a few weeks now and it's not operating now till november all the other telescopes we've got are operating, so that's good. We've got another six, so that's fine. But uh, but the level's out of action till November, right? Um, so uh, one other thing, just to mention to people, is that we 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 are we do record our lectures now, so you can you can enjoy them again later. Um, but we also live stream them, in fact. So so there is a there is a camera at the back um, that I can see red lights on, which probably means it's working. Um, and uh, and and for the people sitting in the front here. That means the backs of your heads are on the are on the camera. So I don't know if, if you don't want to have your head scratching on the camera, you try and resist scratching your head, I suppose. Um, so that's just to just to be aware that there is a, there is some recording going on. Um, uh, very pleased to say that our speaker uh, this evening is is Dr. Tanner Joseph. Um, Tanner's a, a, a research fellow in the Jodrell Bank Centre for Astrophysics. Um, she um, she is from Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and she did her undergraduate degree in Cape Town and then she came to the UK and she did a PhD in Southampton, at uh, the University in Southampton. She went back to uh, Cape Town for, for a few years to do a few research jobs. She spent some time in Texas having an, another research job before she came um, to join us. Um, so I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome Tanner and she's going to tell us all about multi-messenger astronomy. Please welcome her. and thank you to Tim for the nice introduction. I just need to unlock my laptop and then we can get going. So, so this evening I'm going to talk to you all about multi-messenger astronomy and this talk actually originated um, as an update to one of my favorite outreach talks which is on multi-wavelength astronomy. So can I see by show of hands who's familiar with multi-wavelength multi astronomy? Who's heard that term before? Okay, so a few people. Um, and that was the kind of astronomy that was um, the hot thing that you had to sell yourself as, as a young researcher when I was doing my PhD. Um, I did my PhD in X-ray astronomy mostly, um, but my supervisor had the, force, the kind of foresight to sort of push me into doing some radio work as well. And so that's my background in radio um, astronomy and because you had to sell yourself as someone who could do various bits and pieces and I'll go through that in my talk. Um, and now that I'm still very much in the early part of my career, th things have changed so much now. Now we're in this era, I like to call it the era of multi-messenger astronomy. Um, but as you'll see when I go through the talk, this era is actually a few decades old now. It's just suddenly become really cool and Nobel Prize worthy. And so now suddenly the era is now, but it actually started a while ago. So a bit of a history lesson um, to start with. Um, when it comes to astronomy instrumentation, uh, Galileo Galilei, of course, was one of the first people to make telescopes and, um, and use them. And the, these are some images from a, a museum in Florence. So these are his two first telescopes that he used um, in the very early 1600s. And of course, Galileo is famous for uh, being the first person uh, to see Jupiter's uh, four biggest moons and the rings of Saturn. And he got into some political trouble for that. And um, this was the, you know, the Wild West cool cowboy days of astronomy where you could go, you know, to prison for 
saying what you saw when you went to prison. He was imprisoned for a few years. So that was, you know, it's not as risky. Now it's a lot cooler and it's a lot, but it's not as dangerous um, as it was in the 1600s. So what you would see using uh, Galileo's telescopes, of course, is the same thing you would see using your eyes, because telescopes are just slightly bigger eyes, um, is, of course, the visible light, the optical light, that little rainbow there in the middle. But what we know, of course, is that um, the electromagnetic spectrum or the different kinds of light, that there are many different kinds of light, more energetic, less energetic, or if you want to think about it in terms of frequency, uh, low frequency is low energy, which is um, radio waves, um, or big waves. And if you get smaller wavelengths, you have, um, you have higher frequencies, you have higher energies. If you want to think about it in terms of temperature, so the, that temperature, uh, that thermometer at the bottom there shows you sort of representative um, temperatures for a black body, something that's um, radiating perfectly, and what that temperature would be. So for X-rays, like the kind of stuff I look at, um, neutron stars and black holes in, uh, in binaries with another normal star, and they um, gravitationally bound, and the neutron star, the black hole, pulls material from its companion star onto itself, and as that material falls towards the black hole or the neutron star, it heats up and glows in X-rays, and they have a temperature of about 10 million degrees. So, um, yeah, so that's, so yeah, you can think of that side of the, of the plot as higher energy or small wavelengths or um, high frequency or really hot things. And on the side here, like the things that we deal with here at um, Jazzle Bank Radio, so it's lower energy, bigger wavelengths and, um, and cooler things or less energetic things. So, what you have when you combine all these things together is what it gives you, instead of just looking at one image um, or in one wave band, you, you get a more complete um, idea of, the, of what's happening in the universe. So a classic example is the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is very famous. I'm sure you've all seen some version of this beautiful, um, colorful image here. And that's taken with Hubble and the, um, the blue, uh, the green is um, oxygen and the blue is, the green is oxygen three, the blue is oxygen one and the kind of yellowy stuff is silicone. So that just shows you what was, this, this was a massive star that exploded and all the stuff that was inside, all the different chemicals that were synthesized through nuclear fusion um, were flung out in the supernova explosion. But what you don't see is, sorry, let me just check, yeah. What you don't see if you just look by your eye. So this was taken with Hubble. So if your eye was two and a half meters big and you were outside the Earth's atmosphere, this is exactly what you would see. Hubble works, sees the same colors as your eye. And they chose these colors because this is actually what your eye would see. So silic um, silicone does look yellowish to us. Oh, sorry, sulfur does look yellowish to us. Um, oxygen three does look um, greenish to us, to our eyes. So Hubble works exactly like a big eye, but what you wouldn't see is this little bit here inside, so this fits in roughly over here, and that's actually the neutron star, the spinning neutron star. You can see a jet here as well, and this is X-rays. So this is much higher energies, much hotter cloud of gas. You can see it's kind of spinning around like a top because, of course, um, for those of you who are regular visitors to Jojo Bank, you know that we um, th that. Um, this is the place where we talk a lot about pulsars and spinning. And so, the, um, so yeah, so this is a, the remnant of the dead exploded star. It's got a jet coming out of it, and it's spinning, you know, a few hundreds of times per second, and it's about the size of Manchester City Centre. Um, and it's, so there's an enormous amount of energy um, in this. And as you can imagine, when a star explodes, you expect to see something spectacular like this, but what we were missing up until a few decades ago when we actually launched X-ray imaging telescopes outside, um, outside the Earth's atmosphere is all of this. We expected this to be there, and then when we looked in the appropriate wave band, that's exactly what we saw. So here's another example of multi-wavelength um, multi astronomy. Um, this is Centaurus A. We've known about this galaxy since the mid-1800s. It's very well studied. It's one of the closest, um, if not the closest, galaxies with an active supermassive black hole. And um, it's quite famous because it has this pretty little skirt of gas and dust. But other than that, it's quite a smooth, kind of rugby ballish shaped um, glow of stars. 
But actually, when you, and this is the same galaxy now, so that image is over here. If you look in the radio, you see this enorm these enormous radio jets. If you look in X-ray, you see this huge um, X-ray jet over here and this kind of like bubble, this gas bubble of hot X-ray gas. And to me, that looks like an upside down squid. That looks like the head of the squid over there. And then that's like a tentacle or something. Um, and so when you look at this image, just in optical, again, this is what your eye would see if your eye was a 10 meter telescope in Chile. Um, then you see, oh, this is like a really pretty galaxy. This is an interesting feature. But what you miss out is the fact that this is hiding a supermassive black hole that's powering these jets. And the mass of that black hole is estimated to be about 50 million times the mass of our sun. And the length of these jets, let me just double check, yeah, it's about 13,000 light years. And that's f since the mid 1800s, this is all we thought was in there. But actually, when you look in other wavelengths, when you look in the radio and in the X-ray in this case, you see that there's so much more going on there. There's so much physics to unlock. There's so much splendor um, in this seemingly quiet galaxy. And this next one is one of my favorites. Um, so this is an infrared image of a supernova remnant, so the same kind of thing that formed the Crab Nebula, a, a massive star that exploded. And in infrared, you see nothing. But if you look in radio, that's the red. Um, and then the blue over there is um, X-ray. You actually see it's not as, um, it's not this a source is not as, um, I guess complicated as the, uh, uh, doesn't look as complicated as the Crab Nebula, but you can see a much more spherical shape here. So the, um, from that we infer that the explosion was much more symmetric. So it kind of s exploded out in all directions um, with the same amount of energy. And what you learn from radio as well is it radio um, emission traces magnetic fields. And that's something that is very complicated in astronomy to deal with. Um, it has very complicated effects and it's actually very difficult to calculate. So even if you have a supercomputer, when you add the maths in that, is it that, um, that you use to explain magnetic fields, it actually takes up a lot of computational power. So a lot of times, astronomers just kind of either ignore the magnetic fields or we use the most basic assumptions for that. Um, and so what's fantastic about radio is that it traces um, the magnetic fields and gives you insight into something you wouldn't, we can't actually uh, visualize directly. And then with the X-rays, you can see there, that's the leftover neutron star, again, that fast spinning, really hot, small, dense star that's moving around a lot. And what I like to say, this is why this is one of my favorites, is if you were, um, if you had infrared eyes, so your eyes could only see in the infrared like pit vipers, or my favorite thing to talk about in um, public outreach talks is Predator. I really am like super into the Predator, you know, like Alien versus Predator, or when Arnie says, get into the chopper, <laughs> for the, yes, for the older people in the, in the crowd. So that monster is an intergalactic hunter, right? And he comes to Earth and he's hunting people in the, in, in the jungle and then they cover themselves in mud and then suddenly they become invisible to him because we all know that our body temperature emits, um, our body temperature is such that we emit um, infrared radiation. So pit vipers use that to hunt because their eyes this, like, actually hunt um, at night by, using, uh, by, by looking in the infrared and then they see their prey and these vipers then attack their prey and eat them up. So that's kind of how predator works. So if predators now, you know, like cruising through the galaxy looking for something interesting, they'd actually run into trouble because they'd see like, oh yeah, this is like a totally clear patch of space, but actually they'd be running smack into some real serious trouble over here because they just, their eyes just can't perceive um, can't perceive this whole entire neutron star and all the energetic and interesting stuff and magnetic fields going on around there. So this is why it's not just, we're not the only um, you know, species that are limited. Predator is also out there with its faults and we must always remember this lest we become prey. <laughs> so now I've given you some insight into multi-wavelength astronomy and what was important, gosh, when did I start my PhD? It's about 10 years ago. Um, and in that time and for the next few years, it was important that you knew several different kinds of light and how to work with those telescopes and how to get the data and make these composite images so that we can have as complete a picture of the universe as we can using different kinds of light. 
And in the last few years, this has now changed. So now I'm in this phase of my career where it's the era of multi-messenger astronomy and light is not the only thing that carries information about the universe to us. And there are several other messenger, I don't want to call them particles, but several other cosmic messengers that can tell us about the universe that aren't light. And light's interesting, of course, because it's both a wave and a particle. So other types of waves, other types of particles that can give us a window on what's happening in the cosmos. So I thought I would start with something familiar to us all, something that we experience on Earth, and that is meteorites. And I'll tell you something about me. I'm a professional astronomer, and last year was the first time I actually really realized that meteorites form part of multi-messenger astronomy. So if you've never heard of multi-messenger astronomy before this, you're only like nine months behind me because I thought I knew <laughs> what it was, but I actually didn't. Um, so that's how much astronomy changes so quickly. So I, was, I ended up on a multi-messenger panel with, um, with several people at Blue Dot. At the, who's going to Blue Dot this year? Are we all going? Yes. Um, the Saturday is almost sold out, so you need to, you know, if you want to go on the Saturday still, you need to get in there quick. So um, Dr. Sarah Crowther was one of the people on the panel, and she brought some meteorite um, fragments with her, and that was incredible, and she let me touch them. I kept stroking them throughout the panel. It was very exciting. <laughs> Space rocks. But it was in that moment that I realized that meteorites are actually m messenger particles, and we learn about the universe from them. So just to just go through the quick, um, just a quick clarification, um, the difference between meteorites, meteoroids, and meteors. So a meteor is a flash, is the flash of light, the shooting star that you see as something, some particle or rock from outside the Earth's atmosphere comes and interacts with the Earth's atmosphere. It heats up, and that flash that you see as it's burning up, that's the meteor. And a meteoroid is a small chunk of interplanetary debris, so usually some kind of rock or something that originates somewhere in the solar system. Um, and it, and so before it interacts with the Earth's atmosphere, that's a meteoroid. So you have a meteoroid, it's coming towards Earth, it was formed, um, it was formed, yeah, they're leftovers from where the solar system was forming, and when they, so when this meteoroid then interacts with the Earth's atmosphere and starts to burn up, you see a shooting star, you see a, mete a meteor. And if any of that um, meteoroid actually makes it through the atmosphere, anything's left and it lands on Earth, then that's a meteorite. So meteorites are the things that actually make it to land. And these are two examples of really interesting um, meteorites. So normally we expect them to look like lumps of rock. Um, that's not gold. That's not gold. If that was gold, of course, we'd be mining in space right now. We all know that. We know what we're like as a species. We know. Um, so, yeah, so these are bits of interplanetary debris that have traveled through the Earth's atmosphere and actually made it to land on the ground. And they are left over from when the solar system was just forming. So when the solar system was much more chaotic and the planets hadn't solidified into the ones, the eight planets that we know now and Pluto. Um, and they were planetesimals, we call them or protoplanets, and they come smashing into each other, and the moons form, and then something flies into a moon, and et cetera. And then the bits and pieces, the scrap that's left, is, um, is formed into meteoroids, or a meteoroid is a, is a chunk of rock or something that's less than one kilometer across. Anything bigger than that is classed as an asteroid. So there's, that, there's a bit of background on that as well. I have this all written down here, by the way. I do not know this off the top of my head. Like, I'm sneakily just like, oh, yeah, what am I not saying? Yeah, so this is, it's hard to keep all of this straight sometimes. So I should share that with all of you. So what we learn about them is we, what we learn about meteorites is actually about the chemical composition of the early solar system. And that gives us insight to, um, you know, we think we know how planets are formed, but we don't know you know, the pros, the chemical processes, the chemical enrichment, et cetera, that's happened. Um, and so when we actually catch these rocks that come flying from outer space, they're much older than, um, than the rocks that we have here on Earth because they, um, when they were formed, they didn't go through processing the way rocks on Earth here undergo geological processing. Um, I mean, 
we have volcanoes that are making new rocks all the time. So a lot of the rocks on Earth are billions of years younger than the things that, we, that we're looking at with meteorites. And just to go back to these two, so this, um, this is really interesting, this meteorite, because it's actually an igneous meteorite. So for those of you who didn't do high school geography like I did, that was one of the few things I didn't have to look up. Igneous means it's a type of rock that's formed um, in volcanoes, it's formed from seismic activity. It comes from magma that, when it comes to the surface, becomes lava and then cools into rocks. And so this is a chunk of something that was spewed out of, an, of a volcano when the, um, that, yeah, that was active when the solar system was just forming. And that's terribly exciting and terribly interesting because now, now you can do archaeological um, astro seismology but not astro seismology because that actually means like how how stars move but you can start doing geological astro archaeology with with these kind of things that come flying through the earth's atmosphere and that's super exciting and i was very glad and very humbled to know that there's still stuff i can learn and i can now share with people where i never i, I just thought of these things as pretty rocks or pretty lights in the sky but they actually um entire fields of scientific inquiry which is fantastic so the next messenger particle might be, so this is for the particle physicists. Do we have any particle physicists here tonight? No, so not a particle physics crowd, good. <laughs> <laughs> neutrinos. So neutrinos, anyone familiar with neutrinos? Show of hands. Okay, uh, secret particle physics crowd. <laughs> so neutrinos, for those of you who are loyal to astronomy, um, are little particles that are million, more than a million times lighter than an electron. So they have very, very low mass and they have zero electrical charge. And we call them weakly interacting particles or WIMPs uh, because they barely interact with other matter in the universe. And just to give you some context, here's a photo of me in Cape Town um, at the South African Astronomical Observatory next to a sundial. And as I'm standing here, 60, or even now as we sit here, 65 billion neutrinos go through every square centimeter of your body every second. So they're just streaming through us right now. They stream through the universe from wherever they come from. And I'll, in the next slide, I'll show you some of the places we get neutrinos from. And they're just constantly just pouring through us. And it makes no difference to us because they don't interact with normal matter or they very rarely interact with normal matter, so it's very hard to catch them, but if you do catch one of these, you learn a lot. So we have these neutrinos, and they are everywhere, but hard to catch. And where do they come from? So they come from radioactive decay. Um, again, the particle, well, I guess nuclear physics here. So when you have heavy elements like radium, mm. and they break up, and you get a positron, and some other element whose name I've forgotten, and then one of the things you get also is an antineutrino. So the kind of things that happen in, um, in nuclear power stations, those kind of reactions with uranium and stuff, you get neutrinos coming out of there. Um, you get neutrinos from the kind of interactions that happen, uh, uh, nuclear fusion processes that happen in stars, like in the sun. So most of the neutrinos we are experiencing right now and are completely unaware of it um, are solar neutrinos. So they're coming straight through um, to us from the sun. Um, you can also get them from cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are basically um, atoms where all the elect uh, electrons have been stripped off and they're very heavy and they move really fast and they smash into the top um, ap uh, the upper atmosphere and then they cause these particles to, to come out. And part of that particle shower is neutrinos. And you also get them from supernova explosions. So when massive stars explode and die. So just to give you an idea of why these things are interesting is, here's an example, when um, neutrino particles from stars. So the photon travel time from the core where fusion is happening, so hydrogens are melting together to form heliums and heliums are melting together to form carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, yeah, et cetera. Um, you, get, um, part, uh, you get neutrinos being given off um, in these processes, but you also get, of course, light um, photons um, being given off and that transports energy out towards the surface of the of this of the star and that's where we get sunlight from and warmth etc so the photon travel time from the core of something like the sun to the surface of the sun is tens to um, to hundreds of thousands of years so if you want to know about what's happening in the core of our sun or in the core of a star 
photons can't really tell you that. They can only tell you about um, what's happening at the surface. Because once they get to the surface, it takes a photon 8.3 minutes to get to the surface of the Earth. And in the 10,000 to, uh, to 180,000 years that it takes to go from the core to the surface, that you can see here this path that it takes, it's bouncing al around against things and being reprocessed and losing and gaining energy and direction. So it, any information that it had about the core has been lost in these little interactions over all of these millennia. And so you don't really get any core information if you, look, if you try and um, measure photons. But neutrinos take 2.3 seconds to go from the core of the sun to the surface. And they can tell you about the core because they basically stream right through. They're made 2.3 seconds later, they're at the surface. And very quickly, within a few minutes, they, um, they reach the Earth's surface where we can catch them. So in a matter of like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, we can, uh, we can get info, uh, well, we can try and catch a neutrino that came that was just been made in the core. And that's really useful, and that gives us a lot more energy because they are these weakly interacting particles, so they're not jiggled around and bounced around and lost inside the material here. They just stream straight out. So that's super useful. So we actually know more about what's happening in the core of the sun because of this than we do, um, that's hap than we know what's happening in the core of the Earth. So it's actually like we have no way of knowing because fusion doesn't happen in the core of our earth so we don't have neutrinos streaming up from from the center of the earth up towards the surface so we have to rely on geologists and seismic um, events to give us information whereas we we have a very 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 good handle on what's happening in the center of our sun and that's kind of crazy to me um, so another way we can get neutrinos is um, from supernovae and they're super useful because again they ex escape immediately from the explosion. You can imagine when you know some, uh, uh, something 10 to 20 to 30 times the mass of the sun just collapses under its own gravity and explodes out. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of material. It's very dense. It's very murky. And light takes a while to escape again to make its way out. But the neutrinos come straight out. And so if you can catch neutrinos from supernovae, we can get information about the early stages of the supernova explosion. Because let me tell you another astronomy secret, we don't really know how supernovae work. Um, we know they happen, we see them happening, but the actual mechanism that happens in that moment is very tricky to tie down. And there are some competing theories, and we need this kind of information to be able to distinguish between the two or three mechanis mechanisms that we think are at work when, um, when stars explode. So this is kind of cut off at the bottom here, but it says for stars that explode or that collapse without an explosion or in areas where there's lots of obscuring matter, neutrinos can actually be the only way that you could detect um, that you could detect us that a supernova has happened because sometimes you get the massive star, depending on again on the supernova um, mechanism, sometimes instead of an actual supernova explosion, you just get all the matter just falling together, directly collapsing, and then nothing, well, no light comes out, but you could get neutrinos coming out just before they're swallowed up by the resulting black hole. So, how, and I keep saying like, oh, neutrinos, oh, they don't interact, they're weakly interacting particles, etc. So how do we actually catch them? How do you, and, do you, it's, and I put telescopes there because it's actually neutrino detectors, but how do we see and measure these things? So there's several different um, um, detectors around the world. So these detectors have to be, first of all, very, very big. Um, so the bigger they are, the more chance we have of actually seeing some kind of um, neutrino interaction. Um, and these detection signals are obviously very weak because you're getting, you know, like six a year. And you have to be very sure that that's actually what you're seeing. So you have to shield them by putting them underwater. You put them under ice in the um, in Antarctica. So they called it ice cube. There's one under the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and there are about 10 of them, uh, 10 of these neutrino detectors that have been, um, that have been constructed so far. Um, so here's where... Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why the, the era of multi-messenger astronomy has actually been around much longer than we think, because neutrino astronomy has been going on for decades. So neutrinos from cosmic rays smashing into the Earth's um, upper atmosphere were first detected in 1965, and this detector was in the East Rand in, in an abandoned gold mine in Gauteng in South Africa, so that's the province that Joe Johannesburg is in. 
um, where they do all of the gold and platinum and um, coal mining. And so we have some of the deepest mines in the world in South Africa. So they put one of these detectors down there because it's perfectly shields. Um, it shields the detector from other, from other contaminating sources. And in a few years later, in 1968, the first neutrinos from the sun were actually first detected. So technically, we've been in the era of multi-messenger astronomy since the 60s because neutrino astronomy won a Nobel Prize in 1995. So the neutrinos that were first detected in, um, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, um, they, yeah, in, in 68, um, Raymond Davis Jr. and John N. Bacall um, first detected the solar neutrinos and they were awarded the, uh, jointly awarded the 1995 Nobel Prize for Physics. So multi-messenger <laughs> astronomy is not new. It's been Nobel worthy for several decades already. And, um, and it's a very mm. interesting way to learn about the universe. So here's another, so here's an example. So um, in 1987, there was a, a very famous supernova, um, supernova 1987A. And neutrinos were actually detected from the supernova. So this is a this is a Alma and Hubble image of um, of the supernova. It's really beautiful. You can see it uh, um, has nice spherical symmetry. So the explosion happened equally in all directions. Really gorgeous. And we actually detected um, neutrinos from three different um, detectors before we saw the supernova in light. So the neutrinos came first because, as we said. Um, neutrinos are, um, find it easier to escape through all of that matter and all of the chaos and the light takes a while to make it through all the gas and dust and falling, um, falling radioactive material, etc. So, so in a way, they didn't realize this, but the neutrinos were actually the, the early warning system that a supernova was coming. And then they saw the supernova, so the, and they found that the observations agreed with the theoretical understanding of how supernovae work. So that was one step closer to, um, and to getting to grips with what actually happens when a massive star explodes. So yeah, so this is kind of like the proof of concept, like it actually worked. We actually had an early warning system. Um, so now, of course, we need to build this, um, well, build a more sophisticated early warning system where you have networks of um, neutrino detectors across the Earth. Um, and if a, um, a 1987A type supernova happened again, what would happen is they would issue alerts to places like, um, well, to Hubble or to ESO or to Jardel Bank and say, we saw neutrinos because, of course, the more, um, the more detectors you have spread across the globe, the easier it is to triangulate where it's actually coming from. So you can tell the telescopes who would be able to see something to point already in anticipation, and you have a few hours, you have a three-hour window, say, and then they can get ready and line up, and they'll see the supernova as early as possible I using light. But, um, but the neutrinos will have warned us, and that's really interesting. And the number of neutrinos you get also gives you um, information about the kind of physical processes that are happening in the explosion. So the future goals for um, neutrino astronomy are to be able to take detect neutrin neutrinos from active galactic nuclei, um, which is, um, like I showed you, Centaurus A with, with the huge jets. The thing that's, um, that's powering those jets is that supermassive black hole, and that's a, an active galactic nucleus, um, from gamma ray bursts and from starburst galaxies, like the antenna here, interacting galaxies where lots of stars are being formed. So, so yeah, there's Sin A again, that's an AGN. Um, gamma ray bursts are particularly useful because we don't, we don't, we, we don't really know how all gamma ray bursts work, like what the physical mechanism is for that. So we're hoping that neutrinos will be able to give us some information on that going forward. So the next one, of course, is gravitational waves. The next messenger um, is gravitational waves. And this is really cool and in the news because they recently won a Nobel Prize for this um, two or three years ago now. And what gravitational waves are, are they just ripples, not ripples through space and time but the ripples of space and time. So the actual fabric of space is being stretched and compressed and, and moving like a wave. And that happens when you have massive objects accelerating and disturbing, almost like you can think about it almost like some like a heavy marble or something or like a bowling ball on a, she on a rubber sheet, that, that kind of conceptualization of space time. And if you, and if you spun the, 
if you spun, say, the bowling ball, you stuck your fingers in there and you spun it, it would cause the sheet to stretch and contort. So what you need for this to happen, so you the, the waves work in sort of, it's we call them quadrupole waves. So it's not just that they're going up and down. They're going, um, it'll, so how the space contorts is it'll be pulled in one direction and compressed in one direction as the wave goes through. So it's, it's moving in two directions. And basically anything that has mass in the universe causes these um, gravitational waves. It's just that we need the things to be really, really massive for us to be actually be able to detect the gravitational waves. So how it works is as any time something accelerates in space and time, like I'm doing with my arms, it actually generates gravitational waves, but you need to have a, an asymmetry in the mass distribution. So if you have something that's perfectly spherical and it's spinning quietly on its axis, that's not actually going to cause gravitational waves really because you need some kind of asymmetry to disturb, to cause the disturbance and then you have the ripple. So um, if I were to spin like this, you won't really get gravitational waves because the mass is equally distributed. My arms are both out, I have two legs and I'm spinning in such a way that the mass is distributed equally. But if I tuck my arm in and I spun for you, I'm now causing gravitational waves, but because I'm so petite, you can't, de <laughs> you can't <laughs> detect them. So you want big, heavy things going, going around, or you can have two things that have different masses going around, and then you'll get these ripples of space and time. So this was actually uh, gravitational waves were, of course, predicted in general relativity, Einstein's theory of general relativity in 1916, and others had also put forward the idea, um, Oliver Heaviside and Henri Poincaré, um, a few years before that. And gravitational waves, the existence of gravitational waves were indirectly detected, well, evidence for them was indirectly detected in 1974 um, by observing two neutron stars spiraling towards each other. Um, the kind of stuff that they do um, with radio, uh, with radio telescopes like we have here. So what you have here, so one of these neutron stars was a pulsar, which is what we do here at Jodrell Bank, and the other one was uh, just a normal neutron star that wasn't emitting um, beams of radio light. And so there's Earth. The, this is what we saw, and we um, and it was realized that because neutron stars are so we can measure them so precisely, the, the pulses that come from the pulse are so precisely the most accurate clocks in the universe down to, down to um, microseconds. What we could do is when, we, when they measured this is that they could see that the, um, the, the orbital period of the, of, of the system, so the time it takes for them to go around each other once, was actually starting to get shorter and shorter because they were moving closer and closer together. And that they m the, the way in which that time decreased as they moved and spiraled closer and closer together agreed exactly with what you would expect if they were emitting, um, if they were emitting gravitational waves. So gravitational radiation wasn't directly detected, but the effects of it were detected, um, and they fit the theory exactly, and this won Halson Taylor the Nobel Prize. So again, in a way, multi-messenger astronomy is another example of it being something that's been thought about for several decades and has been Nobel Prize worthy for a long time. So they won the Nobel Prize in 1993 for the work they did in 1974, which also, side note, just goes to show that one of the things you need when um, to be in contention for Nobel Prize is also just longevity just because they don't award the Nobel Prize posthumously. So you have to do the work and then you have to quit smoking and drinking and take up some cardio and get very zen and just like ride it out for two, three decades <laughs> and then your time will come. <laughs> so what do, so gravitational waves, cool, whatever, but what do they actually tell us about? So they tell us about systems where no light or particles are actually going to come out. So systems where, yeah, where electromagnetic radiation won't be, uh, won't be generated or won't, yeah, won't exist, or where particles won't exist. Um, they can tell us about supernova explosion dynamics and about what's inside neutron stars. So if you have two black holes merging together or you have a neutron star and a black hole merging together, what you're going to have there is just two masses. Of course, we know a black hole is an area of space-time where nothing, not even light, can escape. So there's going to be nothing to look at. So when they get together, the only way you would know that they are there is through gravitational, uh, well, one of the only ways, there's another way. Um, 
micro lensing or gravitational lensing. But in this case, we're talking about gravitational waves, so let's go with that. You can't know that they're there um, unless you see these waves. And one thing we're also incredibly interested in is what's inside neutron stars. So earlier on, I spoke about neutron stars um, being these dense leftover remnants of massive stars that explode in a supernova and they spin really fast and what size they are. But we actually don't know what's happening inside them. Again, we have several competing theories, but we don't know um, we, yeah, we don't know what's going on inside. There's some kind of interesting superfluid of free particles. We're not really sure. And gravitational waves can, um, is a way for us to be able to figure out what's happening inside if we can measure the gravitational waves coming from neutron stars. And we can measure the deformities in the surface of the neutron stars. Because like I said, imagine I'm a perfectly symmetric neutron star. But if I had one part of me that was sticking up, um, that would cause gravitational waves of a certain shape. And then we can infer um, something about the shape of the neutron star. And the way that it's deformed is directly linked to what's inside it. So yeah, so we can measure what's happening on the outside to great, um, with great precision. And then that will give us um, some constraints and some understanding of what's inside causing those deformities. And when I say deformities, um, these um, neutron stars are so dense that a mountain in a neutron star, which again, like I said, is about the size of a city, um, is about a few millimeters high because the gravity is so intense that anything higher than that just can't actually, there's not enough energy to push anything else up. But even that small disturbance is something that we can probe with gravitational waves. So um, gravitational waves were first detected directly in September 2015. And if you come to my talk, at blue dot in a few months time, then I'll tell you something else interesting about these. I'm not going to tell you this evening. Um, so the, the th um, these were two black holes that merged, and these are the actual waveforms um, uh, seen by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer uh, Gravitational Observatory in the U.S. One of the um, one of the components is in Washington State, and the other one of the components is in Louisiana. So they spread quite far across the U.S. And all these squiggles basically allowed us to, first of all, prove that that part of Einstein's theory is correct. And the kind of information we get from these squiggles is that the first detection happened um, 1,300 million light years away. And one of the black holes that merged was 36 times the mass of our sun. And the other black hole that merged was 29 times the mass of our sun. And that's all just from those squiggles and the complicated maths that we put into that to extract this information. And then a short while later, a few months later, there was a second detection and it was two slightly um, smaller black holes and they were 1,400 million light years away. Um, one of them weighed 14 times the mass of our sun and the other one was eight times the mass of our sun. So that's all the information that you can get from gravitational waves. And because they're two black holes, they emit no light and not even particles like neutrinos can escape from them because, of course, they got, they'll get sucked in. So gravitational waves are the only way to really probe these small, um, small far away black holes. Since then, um, there have been a heck of a lot more um, detections by LIGO. And this is what we call the stellar graveyard. So this is all the dead stars that are merging. Um, so here in the yellow are neutron stars that we know of um, by detecting them electromagnetically. So with things like the Jodrell Bank Telescope or like Hubble Telescope, um, et cetera. And then this one here in the orange is, of course, the what they're calling the golden binary, the two neutron stars that merged, that LIGO detected, um, that merged. Um, and the reason we call it the, gl the golden binary is because we learned in that merger and from subsequent follow-up that all of the heavy, that's, um, those are the kind of um, processes, those two neutron stars merging, that give us gold and platinum and other heavy metals like that. So a, Jupiter's, a Jupiter mass worth of gold was created in the merger of those two neutron stars. So that if you, yeah, any kind of gold or platinum jewelry that you have, that's where it comes from. So you literally, we adorn ourselves in star stuff, which is very cool. I think, and just kind of put it in perspective, Jupiter has a mass a thousand times heavier than the Earth. 
So yeah, so whatever gold we dig up from the Earth came from um, originally from these merging neutron stars. And so here the purple, again, the purple is electromagnetically confirmed black holes. And the blue are all the ones that LIGO found. And you can see they systematically, they're all heavier, more massive than the ones really that we find um, electromagnetically. So there's, there's something about LIGO. The way LIGO is set up, uh, it's easier for it to find heavier things. Um, and then there's this interesting gap here. You can see there's nothing over here. And we don't know if that is from physics or just because the things we've built to see neutron stars uh, or the telescopes that we've built to see neutron stars and black holes are missing these. And LIGO's not seeing these low mass things either. It's not set up to see that. Um, so we're still trying to figure out, we're building better and better telescopes to try and figure out if, this is, if there's a physical reason, something in, again, in supernovae that we don't understand that causes this gap. So you can either get these lightweight neutron stars or heavier black holes, but you can't get black holes that are that light or neutron stars that are that heavy. We don't know if that's physics or if that's just um, a bias in our technology that we need to sort out and build something better to be able to find those things if they exist. So that's what we're also trying to do. But in the meantime, LIGO is filling in all these masses here. And this highest mass here is about 80 solar masses. Now we're getting to a, another physical limit where we think from what we understand about how massive stars um, grow and change and die that this is roughly the upper limit for how you can for what you can make a, how you can make a black hole from one star and so anything heavier than that has to come from some kind of merger or stars that um, were formed very early in the universe when there was only helium and hydrogen so LIGO might start to uncover things here heavier than this that are going to challenge confirm destroy um, our concepts of um, yeah, how stars form and grow and die, or what the early universe's elements were really like to be able to um, allow heavier masses of black holes. So there's a, a gap over here in, in knowledge and a gap over here in knowledge that we're trying to fill in um, using, elect using light from the one end and then also using um, gravitational waves from the other end, and we're trying to fill all of this in and maybe even take it higher. So this image here is um, showing you the some localizations sort of in the southern hemisphere of where we think these some of these um, detections happened in the sky. So you can see over here, this is like an enormous area to try and search for um, a, a electromagnetic counterpart. So to try and point Hubble or Lovell telescope at um, at the LIGO detection to see if there's anything there to follow up with. Um, so how we did that actually for the neutron star, neutron star binary for the golden binary is that it wasn't just LIGO that was used in that detection um, or that saw that event. Um, there, there is a, there's a gravitational wave observatory called Virgo and it's in Italy and so they could triangulate between the two US stations and the Italian station and make a much smaller patch, is that over there? Sorry, this one. A much smaller patch on the sky, and then they sent out alerts to um, all the Southern Hemisphere telescopes, including the ones in South Africa and Australia and Chile, and they followed up, and some space telescopes as well, and that's a much smaller patch of sky to look through than that or that which was found just with, that's uh, the best we could do just with LIGO. So w once we had three on the sky, or three active, um, we actually went and followed up and found um, electromagnetic counterparts. And what was so interesting was that all of the light didn't come to us at once. Um, they kind of switched on in sequence. Um, and the radio was seen last. And the x-rays were seen first. And the sequence in which the, the different types of light reached us also told us a story um, about the physics that we think is happening in there. And so we also know that this two, these two neutron stars merging um, cause some kind of gamma ray burst. So earlier on I said we don't really know what causes gamma ray bursts. So with this discovery we found that some types of gamma ray bursts have now confirmed to be um, what happens when you have two neutron stars merging. So even if we don't see um, the gravitational waves, um, when you see certain types of gamma ray bursts, you now know that's that, that means that there was another golden binary happened and some more gold is spread throughout the universe. 
So, in summation, altogether, what we have here is that light and space debris and particles and gravitational waves give us this multi messenger astronomy where we're trying to really drill down and figure out what's happening in the universe far away, um, like you would see with um, neutrinos or gravitational waves nearby um, in our solar neighborhood. Um, with and with light, the traditional kind of way that we've been doing astronomy for many centuries. Um, and so this is a very exciting time to be in astronomy because things have changed, so many um, breakthroughs have been made and so many interesting game-changing, paradigm-shifting things have happened in my very short career so far. And um, so yeah, so I would like to take you all um, on this with me. Actually, like I said, when I first gave this talk, it was entirely a multi-wavelength talk, and then I had to update it to multi-messenger. So I hope to be able to come back to you in the next two, three, five years and add more updates to this. So some of the things I spoke about, like the neutrino early alert system where we want to see neutrinos, um, or where we'll be seeing neutrinos sending alerts out to other telescopes to look out for things. Hopefully I'll be able to give you updates on, on that kind of stuff. Or as we build more and more gravitational wave um, observatories, so LIGO, is going to start working again in a few weeks. They're going to have their third run, so they're going to find even more um, gravitational wave events and give us even more things to fill in that plot in the, um, in the stellar graveyard. And then the Japanese are also busy building a, um, a gravitational wave detector. Um, and the Italian one is also being worked on and being upgraded. So I'll be able to give you more updates on that and we'll fill in that plot together. And m you know, who knows, maybe there'll even be like an, a, a meteorite nearby that we can talk about. Maybe Sierra Crowther will let me bring one and hold it up and then maybe I can touch it in front of you and we can all be excited. But I don't think she'll let me pass it around um, to, e to everyone, but maybe we can be in the room with it and that'll be great. And maybe it'll be magnetized and then we can like throw coins at it and stuff see if they stick. So I, yeah, I hope that this is a talk that grows and changes and evolves and you come back um, um, and learn more and learn with me because yeah, I'm, I'm very comfortable with telling people when I don't know stuff and the stuff I've learned because we're all just learning together. So it'll be a learning experience for me and for you. And that's the end of my talk and I hope you had a, I hope it was interesting. Thank you very much, Tana, for an incredibly informative and incredibly entertaining talk. I'm sure everyone will agree. Um, so uh, we've got time for some questions. So I think um, uh, Naomi's got a, a microphone at the back and I've got a microphone at the front. Um, so if anybody would like to st stick their hand up who would like to ask a question, we can, we can move a microphone in your general direction. And I promise I won't just stand at the front and point and make Naomi go and walk around. I, I will do it myself. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. I was just wondering how you could tell the difference between a cosmic ray neutrino and a sun-based neutrino. Um, so I think, well, part of that is that the cosmic rays, so uh, did everyone hear the question? Okay. So part of it is that the cosmic rays will, won't just produce neutrinos. They'll produce a, a full particle shower. Where, so the cosmic ray will come in with a lot of energy and will interact with um, the ozone or whatever's in the molecules or in the top of the atmosphere. And um, yeah, the, it, it won't just produce um, neutrinos. So you'll see other stuff with it as well, and then you'll know kind of roughly where it comes from. Contradictory. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's a good one. How do you tell which direction a neutrino has come from, g given it probably only hits one particle in, y in your detector? Um, so, the, yeah, the detector's so big, so as it, as it kind of, again, the, if the, so the detector's really big, and it's the same kind of thing as that particle shower that I was talking about with the cosmic ray. So now imagine the neutrino is the cosmic ray, and the Earth's atmosphere is now replaced by this big vat of, um, heavy water, which is one of the thing, substances that we use um, to try and catch neutrinos. Or another one is dry cleaning fluid. So one of some of the early, um, earlier ones use dry cleaning fluid. Um, so the neutrino will come in and it will also cause a particle cascade and then you, you kind of trace it back to where it, 
by the direction of the particles that cascade, you trace it back. And that's also, by the way, how ground-based gamma ray telescopes work. Um, so gamma rays come in from gamma ray bursts or stars or galaxies or something. And they also have high energy and they interact with the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And from that particle cascade, we call that Cherenkov radiation. Um, it's a blue light. And then it illuminates some part of the optical telescope that's looking at this blue light. And from there, from the way that it illuminates the different parts, you build the path back. So that's, yeah, cosmic rays work like that. And the neutrino detectors also work like that. Anyone else uh, want to put their hand up? No? You're all absolutely sure you understand the whole of multi-messenger <laughs> astronomy? Yeah. There, is a, there is a test on the way out. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, since six, was it 65 billion uh, neutrinos per second per square centimetre, and did you say they're, qui it's, they're quite rare when they're caught in the detectors? Yes. So why is that? Because there must be trillions passing through those massive detectors. Yeah, they're just weakly inter interacting particles. That because they, first of all, well, they don't have... Um, they don't have any charge on them, so they don't interact with, um, they don't interact electromagnetically. So this is why, um, in the longer version of this, where I, um, I had to trim things down because I had to add extra stuff because of the meteorites. But um, we explain, for instance, another neutral particle that we know of is the neutron, right? So the neutron also doesn't interact electromagnetically, but the problem with the neutron is if you leave it alone for 15 minutes, it will disintegrate into a proton. Um, an electron and an anti-neutrino, so you can't leave them alone. Whereas neutrinos are just neutrinos; they don't um, they don't change into a different kind of particle, although they do change into different flavors of neutrino. <laughs> so there's yeah. So that was something that puzzled us for a long time when we were studying the sun because we were we thought we were uh, we worked out the um, nuclear reactions calculations and we're like, oh, we should be getting a certain number of neutrinos, and we're only getting a third of of the f um, neutrino flux that we were supposed to be getting and then we found out that they actually change flavor so there's three flavors of neutrino um and the reason we were only getting a third of the expected number is because we were looking for one type of neutrino but there were two others so the actual flux was conserved we just didn't know it so to kind of to come back to your question so they don't have elect they don't have electric charge so, so they won't interact the way charged particles will interact um, like uh, like your electrons, your protons, your yeah, yeah, electrons and protons. Um, so so that's one thing. And then because they're so tiny, because they you know they um, have mass l less than a millionth of the mass of an electron. Um, they have they're very tiny. They're teeny tiny. That so they have a, what we call small cross section of interaction. Because they're so tiny, they just slip through everything. Um, and so, and with photons, like you can say, oh, well, photons don't weigh anything, but photons interact electromagnetically with anything that's charged. So that's why any matter that's around that's charged, um, like yeah, any loose photons or electrons will interact with a photon, but photons, but neutrinos don't interact in that physical process. So they, they just um, go unimpeded, and every now and again they'll hit something. Um, statistically, they're going to hit something. Um, that will interact, and sometimes that something is our um, neutrino detector. Yeah, a um, question about photons uh, traveling from the core of the sun to the surface. How was how was that time scale uh, verified? Um, it's well, it's a theoretical. That's why there was that huge <laughs> range, ah. right? Um, <laughs> Ten thousand years to one hundred and seventy thousand years. Yeah, good so variance. it's um, we yeah, you can work out sort of from what we know about how photons interact with matter, and we um, and what we um, what we know the density of the matter in the sun is at you know at various at various points because it's not uniform density. It's much denser in the core and it gets yeah. less dense as it goes out. So then the rate of interaction with with things in the like for the photon no. changes. But yeah, just from how we know photons interact, certain like those energy of photons interact with that density of material and that type of material that has a certain charge on it. You can calculate what we call the, m the mean free path, so the average distance that it will travel before it interacts with another particle that bounces it off, bounces it off, 
and then you can kind of add that all together and, and work out the, the travel time. So it's a postulation. Not yeah, a that's what has that, that, big, that big range. I think there was one other one just near, near there, yeah. Do you think multi-messenger -mess astronomy will help us to understand dark matter? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that is certainly something that people are hoping uh, could happen because um, there's n there is kind of a consensus, excuse me, on what dark matter is. We think it's some kind of particle rather than we don't understand gravity, even though we don't really understand gravity. We think we understand it better than the, uh, the alternative theory, which is that we don't understand gravity at all and there's no dark matter. We just don't know how gravity works. So we think we kind of have a handle on gravity. We're still testing it. Um, but there's this idea that, yeah, that gravity, well, that dark matter particles could interact gravitationally and give off um, gravitational waves, but then of course they have to be very massive and they have to happen on times, it has to happen on time scales that we can actually detect. Because if they, yeah. So there are some people that think it might shed light on that, but that's again, that's assuming that dark matter is some kind of particle that, that interacts in a way that would give out gravitational waves that we can measure. So at the moment it's not obvious, but there are some people that think it could help us constrain how much dark matter is out there because what it's going to do sort of indirectly to dark matter, to measuring dark matter directly, what gravitational waves would do is let us know how many black holes are out there or double neutron stars are out there. So things that are dark in that they don't give off light, um, but we know what they are. So if we, so we can work out like how much dark matter we think is in the universe or in some area around a galaxy or something. Um, and then we can use gravitational waves to give us an estimate of how much of that un unseen matter is actually stuff like black holes that are merging or neutron stars that are merging. We can subtract that and then that'll give you a firmer idea of how much is actually still unaccounted for in dark matter. So in that way we can start to constrain um, yeah, how much dark matter there is and where it is and how it's distributed. Any other questions? I've got one. Can I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> um, fast radio bursts, uh -huh. these flashes of fast radio. Is, is there any link between these and any of these things, like these neutron star merging events you were talking um, about? So that's a good question. Um, at the moment, no. At the moment, the fast radio bursts are, yeah, they're, they're not connected. Um, we don't, we literally don't know what we are. We think there's some, something happens to a neutron star, but we think it's an isolated neutron star, so it probably won't be, so it won't be merging with anything. Um, but what we learned from the, the two neutron stars merging is that that explains a, a, a big chunk of what gamma ray bursts were because for a long time we didn't know what was causing gamma ray bursts and now we know what causes some gamma ray bursts so we're taking a step in the right direction so we might come to find out that fast radio bursts are um, gravitational wave emitters because the thing about fast radio bursts is we already know there are two populations right they are fa so fast radio bursts are exactly what they sound like you see them in radio telescopes they like flashes and you're like okay is it a pulsar no because it doesn't repeat and it's and it's really far away um, but they are repeating, there are two known repeaters now, two known repeating fast radio bursts, but they don't repeat like pulsars, because remember I said pulsars are the most accurate clocks in the universe. When we see the pulses, they come at with like, with very like precise timing. Uh, the fast radio bursts don't repeat in that way, so, we, so they're not pulsars, uh, but some of them, two of them repeat, and about 60 of them don't repeat, or we haven't seen them repeat yet. So we don't know if these are two distinct classes and different physical processes are happening in them, or if the ones that we haven't seen repeat just haven't repeated yet and might have to wait 20 years to see it repeat and then suddenly it becomes a repeater. So we don't, we don't know a lot of about what fast radio bursts are, but they might turn out to be the progenitors of things. So the, yeah, the things that turn into gravitational wave um, sources or the other way around. Um, so I guess, yeah, watch this space. That'll be a super cool thing to add to this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Any final questions for Tana? No, 
Okay, well, let's thank her again for a really brilliant talk. Thank you.